country. When Bill and Hillary Clinton left the White House 15 years ago, they say they had no money, owed millions, and didn't know how they'd pay for Chelsea's college education. We came out of the White House not only dead broke, but in debt. Since then, the Clintons have earned more than $130 million. Most people assume they've amassed their wealth through speaking engagements, where they collect fees as high as $750,000. But who pays and why? Peter Schweitzer's bombshell book, Clinton Cash, the untold story of how and why foreign governments and business help make Bill and Hillary rich, has people in Washington political circles and around the world talking about donations to the Clinton Foundation and what might be next. Well, it's a fascinating book. It's called Clinton Cash, and the author's Peter Schweitzer. It's a pleasure to have him back with us uh, on the 700 Club. Peter, welcome. Glad to see you. It's great to be on with you always, Pat. Thanks for having me. Hey, look, let's start talking about this foundation. When Bill Clinton left the White House, he formed a foundation. What was it? What was it all about? Well, the Clinton Foundation is supposed to help people uh, in economic development, uh, deal with health issues around the world. So, you know, it started with this noble purpose, and it does do some good things. I'm not saying it doesn't do anything good. The problem is, is that they have really created these partnerships and have accepted money from uh, some very, very troubling people. Uh, and they've also, frankly, hidden a, a lot of donations that they said that they were going to disclose. I think that's the real problem with the foundation. I who, who's given them money? It's, it was, let me start with how much money has the foundation gotten right now? What's the, do you know what the net worth is? Well, basically, Pat, from 2001 to the present, we're looking at about $2 billion, uh, roughly $150 million a year they take in. And, you know, they get it from U.S. corporations, but in this book, I focused exclusively on foreign uh, entities. That's foreign corporations, uh, foreign businesses, foreign governments. Uh, and in a lot of cases, these are, you know, elites that are operating uh, in very, very troublesome areas that have, you know, huge problems with human rights, corruption, and uh, have long histories in those areas. All right, now, when Hillary becomes Secretary of State, uh, they make her uh, sign an agreement uh, that uh, uh, she will disclose <clears throat> funds going into the cam uh, to the foundation and that if they will not accept certain funds except that which has been disclosed. Talk about that for us. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The Clinton Foundation says, oh, we're the most transparent foundation out there. Well, they are because they were forced to, uh, not by me or by conservative Republicans, but by President-elect Barack Obama. A condition for her becoming Secretary of State in early 2009 was that she agreed to disclose all contributions to the Clinton Foundation and that there be a process to vet donations that were coming in. Uh, the problem is, is that I point out in the book, they violated that agreement almost immediately. Uh, they took multi-million dollar donations from foreign businesses that had interests before the State Department. Those were never disclosed. Uh, they have now come back and admitted uh, that I'm correct, uh, that those donations were not disclosed. Uh, but the problem is we don't know what we don't know, Pat. I mean, there was a report yesterday uh, in uh, the Washington Post and in Bloomberg that they admit there are more than 1,100 1,100 undisclosed donations, and that's what they're telling us. It could be even more than that. You know, I, I'm head of a couple of charities, but I tell you, uh, this is a shakedown racket. I, I have never heard uh, of anybody uh, being like a vacuum cleaner to get that kind of money. Is there an implied promise that either they will get access to federal government or that there will be some sort of favors given by Bill or Henry Clinton when people give that kind of money? Well, I think certainly for some of them, there's this sense that giving a contribution to the Clinton Foundation is a retainer. In other words, that it's granting them access. And if you look at the pattern of conduct uh, during her tenure as Secretary of State, it's very, very clear that you have a pattern repeated dozens of times, which is Hillary Clinton takes a position on an issue. There's an influx of maybe tens of millions of dollars, even more than $100 million in some cases. And then she ends up making a policy decision 
situation that is favorable to the people who have sent the money. And sometimes she is reversing course from the previous position that she had. The only thing that happens in between is there's this large influx of money. So it's a very troubling pattern that goes to the heart of what kind of decision she's making and why she's making them. All right, well, let's talk about that one that's gotten the most publicity. This uh, a fellow named Juster, uh, uh, has, uh, uh, he's been in the mining business for some years, and uh, he starts a little company called Eurasia, and um, they bid for the uranium rights in Kazakhstan. And uh, in your book, you point out this is like a pipe dream. There's no way a little country like this is going to get it. But then <clears throat> President Nurbayev of Kazakhstan wants to be recognized as a world leader by Bill Clinton, and Bill Clinton embraces him. What is the nexus between Nurbayev and Clinton and Justra? Uh, it's a great question, Pat. I mean, the timeline is very clear. In September of 2005, Bill Clinton is in Kazakhstan with Frank Justra. Frank Justra wants to get these very lucrative uranium mining concessions. Bill Clinton says very nice things about Nazarbayev, says he's a great leader. He's got a great human rights record, which is ridiculous. It's, it's a very, very repressive uh, uh, country and regime. Uh, shortly after that, Frank Justra is given these lucrative uranium concessions. He has very little experience in the uranium business. Much larger companies, more experienced that were bidding for them, did not get them. And then weeks after that, that, Frank Schuster sends more than $30 million to the Clinton Foundation. And that's the beginning of this path that ultimately leads to the Russian government mm -hmm. itself owning 20% of the uranium in the United States. Well, Schuster now takes this company public. I think he goes out on the Vancouver Exchange, Canaccord Capital. You said it's the biggest deal they've ever done. Uh, so he right. gets, at that point, he gets to be enormously wealthy, right, with stock? That's right. I mean, the estimates are that he made tens of millions. One estimate is he made $300 million off of this deal. And this company, this tiny company, Eurasia Energy, becomes something called Uranium One. And Pat, they start acquiring uranium assets in the United States to the point by 2010, they have 20% of all the uranium reserves, what's estimated to be 50% of production by 2015. And that's when the Russians come calling. Well, now, uh, the Russians want to build uh, nuclear bombs, but they also want to have nuclear uh, reactors. And <clears throat> the price of uranium has gone up because of the demand from China and so forth. And uh, Putin uh, has one of his guys start buying in. But in order to get that resource, they have to have the approval of the State Department. Now, what happened then? Well, that's, that's exactly right. So what you have is this uranium company that the Russians want to buy into. In order for that to happen, the State Department needs to sign off on it with some other government agencies. Hillary Clinton's foundation and her husband's foundation have nine shareholders, nine shareholders involved in this Uranium One company that send a combined $145 million to the Clinton Foundation. This during the arc of this story. And Hillary Clinton and the State Department end up okaying this deal. And what's ironic about that, Pat, is she has a record on the issue of foreign governments owning critical industries in the United States, like uranium. She has a record of opposing these deals. But in this case, she actually comes out in favor of it. Before it's finished, Putin and the Russians wind up getting 100% of the stock of Uranium One cleared by the State Department, which gives them access to 50% of America uranium production, was that, was that the number? Yeah, it's, it was projected to be 50% when the deal went through in 2010. It is today 20% of all the uranium assets in the United States. And by the way, the Russians said that they would not export any of that uranium. But as the New York Times reported last Thursday, uh, in fact, uranium that's owned by Uranium One in the United States has been exported to Canada and is ending up who knows where. So that fundamental question is, is U.S. uranium being used for nefarious purposes around the world? We don't know. That's, that's a very scary prospect. Well, you know, you, you covered the waterfront on this from Pacific Rubialis to all the rest of it, but let, let's go to, to uh, Haiti. Hitler, uh, uh, 
Bill Clinton became like the economic czar of Haiti, and uh, they have a telephone company down there, and uh, uh, it's very lucrative because those Haitians are calling the United States all the time to their, talk to their friends and relatives. What was the deal on that? Is how did the Irish uh, O'Brien get hand, get his hands on that? Yeah, you know, again, you have this nexus of relationship of, of wealthy of foreign investors, in this case, an Irish gentleman named Dennis O'Brien, who has business interests in Haiti. The earthquake happens. There is a very gener generous rush to put aid in, the United, uh, in, in Haiti from the United States, including billions of dollars in taxpayer money. And the problem is, is that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton make a series of decisions in Haiti on reconstruction that end up benefiting some of the biggest control contributors to the Clinton Foundation, including Dennis O'Brien. Uh, they set up this mobile financial system uh, that operates through the telephone system, which is, by the way, owned by Dennis O'Brien. Dennis O'Brien is a multi-million dollar contributor to the Clinton Foundation. Uh, he has facilitated uh, speeches uh, by Bill Clinton, paid for a speech for him in Jamaica. And in return, uh, the Clintons set up this system of money transfers, which puts, you know, tens of millions of dollars in the pocket of Dennis O'Brien's company uh, and makes him even wealthier. It's, it's crony capitalism on steroids, and it's using the official powers of the State Department and U.S. taxpayer money to help make their benefactors even wealthier. Oh. Peter, uh, these speeches, now I think Clinton, didn't he go to Ireland and make a speech at like 750 grand? I mean, you've got to say some pretty wonderful words to get paid that kind of money for a speech. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable, Pat. You know, like most ex-presidents, Bill Clinton hit the lecture circuit, and we expect that. But something happened in 2009. When Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, his speaking fees, particularly from overseas interests, went up threefold, sometimes fourfold. He got huge, big paydays from foreign entities that had business before the State Department. There's only one or two ways to explain it. Number one, Bill Clinton all of a sudden got even more eloquent in 2009 or these entities recognize the fact that, that by hiring him as a speaker, they could have access to his wife who was gonna make decisions that were very important to them. And there's a very troubling pattern there again. High speaking fees paid by somebody who had never sponsored them before. Hillary Clinton shortly after takes favorable action for the benefit of those entities. You know, Peter, the average person, myself among them, would be absolutely shamed out of our mind if we had done stuff like this. They don't seem to have any shame, do they? they I think they seem to believe that they are uh, doing such good and virtuous things that the rules don't apply to them and that it's okay for them to cash in. It's okay for them to take large contributions from people in Africa that deal with warlords, uh, that deal with uh, you know, very troubling human rights situations with people that uh, have, have criminal records uh, and have been charged and convicted in, in uh, uh, courts around the world for various crimes. Uh, I think they believe that they are so good and virtuous that it doesn't matter that they're doing those things. Uh, that's the only explanation I can come to. By the way, their daughter Chelsea bought a $10 million apartment in New York. Where did she get the money for that? <laughs> well, the Clintons have done very, very well in the post-presidential years. We expect that uh, ex-presidents are going to take in some money, but uh, it's, it's been remarkable. And when you look at the pattern of who is paying them and why, you know, look, the Clintons are very shrewd people. They've been called a lot of things over the years. Naive is not one of them. They have to know why people are throwing money at them, and it doesn't seem to bother them, and, and it allows them to, uh, you know, to live beyond their wildest dreams as far as wealth is concerned. Um, are you having threats against your own person because of your expose? Uh, I, you know, I'll just say, Pat, um, that, that uh, I do have security now. Uh, that's happened as a result of the book. Uh, it was not, uh, not something that actually I pushed for, uh, but uh, was encouraged by other individuals because of various things going on. And I'll just, I'll just leave it at that.
Well, Peter, it's a fabulous book. The research is exhaustive, ladies and gentlemen. It will stand up to scrutiny if anybody wants to attack it. Page after page after page of research documentation. It has, we're talking about African warlords. We've got uh, Colombian uh, oil concessions, uh, timber concessions. We've got things all over the world. And all of the deals somehow flow back into the Clintons to get a little piece of the action. It's a fascinating book. It'll be uh, Peter, it'll be available, I think, Tuesday on the book stands. Yeah, you can pre-order it online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. But yes, it'll be in bookstores on Tuesday, May 5th. Well, it's a hot seller. And thank you so much for being with us. It's a fascinating read. Appreciate your, your work. Thank you so much, Pat. I appreciate it.